Hi everyone, welcome to our first webinar for Giving Day for Apes this year. Um, I hope you all can hear me and see my screen. Um, but I am here with Jackie Bennett from GFAS. Hi, Jackie. Hello, everybody. All right, so just uh, quick introductions before we dig in. Oops, sorry, my slides were jumping. Uh, my name is Linda Gerhardt. I'm the Senior Community Engagement Manager here at Mighty Cause. I've been working with um, Jackie at, and Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries uh, on Giving Day for Apes since 2017. So I'm really excited to get started again this year. Um, and we also have Jackie, who you all know and email a lot. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, today's agenda, um, we're going to start with an introduction from Jackie, um, just to say hello to everybody and introduce you to this year's event. Um, we're also going to go through some Giving Day basics. So if this is your first year, or if maybe you are new to your organization, you haven't participated before, you have the, the full picture of what Giving Day for Apes is all about. Um, then we're going to go into Giving Day strategy, or I'm sorry, email marketing strategy. The agenda is a little off, so I apologize for that. We're going to do email marketing strategy, and then we are going to do a Q&A with me and Jackie. So if you have a question for Jackie, you can ask her. And if you have a question about the technical side or email marketing, you can ask me. Um, we will be taking questions at the end of the presentation just because we have a lot of information to get through. So if you think of something while I'm me or Jackie are talking, just stick that into the questions box of your go-to webinar panel, and we'll make sure that we make time to get to it at the, uh, the during the live Q&A. All right, and with that, I will pass the mic to Jackie. Thank you, Linda. Um, first, I want to say welcome to everyone today. I know this year has been a surprising and challenging one for everyone, and sanctuaries and rescue centers like yours have had some special challenges, of course. So we're really happy to again be presenting Giving Day for Apes and giving you a chance to promote your organizations so you can tell your stories, raise some funds, and maybe win some prizes too. Um, this year, we again have the very generous support of Arcus Foundation, as well as a returning prize sponsor in the American Anti-Vivisection Society, and we are grateful to both of them. Also, as with last year, Mighty Cause has demonstrated its commitment to a successful Giving Day for Apes by lowering its platform fee from the standard 6.9% down to 4.9%, which means more funds go directly to our participating organizations. Oh, I promised in my email for this webinar that we'd have a sneak preview today of our prizes for this year's event, and that's something we're really excited about, and that's going to come a little later in the presentation. And finally, today is the first in a series of three webinars we're offering this year, and we hope you'll join us again for the next two. Those are listed on the slide. We have one on August 25th, and then our third on September 10th. Uh, you're able to register now through the Giving Day website, and we'll send some reminders as well. So with that, I'll turn it over to Linda. All right, thank you. Okay, so like I said, I just wanted to start off with some basics, sort of stepping back for people who may be new to the event or maybe just need to be reoriented to the event from last year. Um, so first of all, how does Giving Day for Apes work? Um, Giving Day for Apes is on Tuesday, October 13th uh, this year, and the goal is to raise awareness uh, about the issue of ape welfare and conservation and to help uh, your sanctuaries raise funds that help you con to continue to do your important work. Um, you'll be competing with other sanctuaries and rescue centers to win prizes, um, as Jackie mentioned, and our next webinar will be all about the prizes. So if you want the full rundown, make sure you sign up for that one. Um, and the event is essentially a marketing opportunity. It's a chance for your organization to engage with sponsors and engage with your partners, engage your, your supporters and your donors, and talk about the issues that your organization um, handles. In terms of what you need to do to participate, it's really simple. Um, you need to register your organization, which I assume most of you on this uh, webinar have already completed, um, but it is invite only. Um, you know, Jackie has reached out to everybody who is invited to participate this year, and then she'll go through and approve your organization based on the information in your registration. Um, you need to update your profile for 2020, which we're gonna talk about more in depth in a moment. Um, and you also need to plan a fundraising campaign for giving Day for Apes. Um, you'll need to promote your campaign to your followers, invite your supporters to do peer-to-peer -peer fundraising for you. There is some prize money tied up in that. And then just raise money for your cause. So it's really just an opportunity 
for your organization to get out there, talk to your partners, your sponsors, your followers, your supporters, your biggest donors, um, and just you know talk to them and get them engaged in your cause. So that's really all it is. Um, it can seem a little bit complicated when you get in the weeds, which is why I just wanted to step back um, and just emphasize that participation is really easy and it's just an opportunity for your organization to reach out to your donor base and also uh, win some fun prizes. All right, so there have been some changes on the Mighty Cause platform since last year. So I wanted to sort of reorient everyone since it's very likely that many of you haven't visited Mighty Cause since last year's Giving Day for Apes event um, and go through some of the things that have been changed or updated and just sort of reorient you to what the, the key things you need to find on your profile are. Um, this part of the webinar is going to be a little bit technical, so apologies in advance, um, but hopefully it'll get you acclimated to any changes and allow you to get up and running more quickly when you log in this year. So one of the first things you're likely to notice when you log in um, to get started for 2020 is that the dashboard has changed. Um, hopefully it's pretty easy to understand since we've designed it to be intuitive and easy to navigate, but I just wanted to go through it from the top down and explain what you're looking at. <clears throat> first, at the very top of your dashboard, you'll see the name of your organization. Now, if you're an administrator for multiple organizations, this is how you'll toggle between them. If you manage a few different pages, you can click on the name of your organization on your dashboard um, to access any other organization profiles you may be managing. Um, below that, You've got your overview screen, um, which should be familiar to you. Um, that is where you'll find your to-do list that has some key items for you to complete um, on your profile, um, any Mighty Cause announcements, and a few key metrics, which can be really helpful if you're just looking to get a quick look at what has happened with your organization on Mighty Cause recently. Beneath that, you have all of your fundraising tools um, under fundraising. Um, the dashboard is organized in carrots, so if there's a lot of individual tools um, to access as there are with fundraising, um, you can click on the carrot, which is the little arrow on the left-hand side, and expand the profile to um, access the, the, the specific tools. Um, so under fundraising, you can access your profile, you can edit your profile, you can view and manage your campaigns. This is also where you can get an overview of all the peer-to-peer -peer campaigns that are set up for your organization. Um, you can add matching grants and customize your checkout flow. So there's a lot going on in that fundraising section, but an easy rule of thumb is that if you're looking for a fundraising tool, it is under fundraising, which is hopefully easy to remember. Um, and below that is reports, um, which you may have Yes, is where we put all of your reporting. So you'll go here to find your donation report, your disbursement report, and your donor, donor retention reports, and anything that you need to pull a spreadsheet for is located under reports. Um, and finally, you have your settings, which is where you can manage your information. You can add or remove admins, manage your EFT if you're getting direct deposit disbursements, and more. Um, so it's pretty easy to navigate, but it is a little bit different from last year, so I just wanted to go through that very quickly. So once you're logged in and oriented to your new dashboard, you'll want to update your profile. Um, a lot of you have really fantastic profiles, but from time, from time to time, Jackie and I will see old information in people's stories. Um, so just take a look and you know, audit your page for anything that might be out of date or could be updated. Um, your story is also a really great place to add new graphics, new images, a new campaign video, and so on. Um, so even if your information is fine and there's nothing explicitly out of date, um, it's a new year, so it's an opportunity to jazz it up and make it more compelling so that people will be inspired to stay on your page for longer and read more about your organization. Um, a lot of organizations have been hard hit by coronavirus um, and have had to sort of change how they do things. So this is also an opportunity you can do, you can use to weave that story of how your organization is in managing in these crazy unprecedented times in your story. So just take a look at your story and make sure that you're telling the full story there and that it's updated for 2020. Um, most organizations don't change their logos that often, but you can always see if you need an or a logo refresh. Um, a lot of organizations for giving events will actually add their own special giving day uh, logo. So you can always take a look at your logo, see if it's the one you want, um, and if there's any way that it can be refreshed. Um, this part is a little hidden, but it's really important, and that is updating your thank you page and thank you message every year, because donors see those. Um, they see your thank you page after they make their donation, and they see 
see the message in the receipt that we send them right after they complete their, their donation. So they're very visible to donors. Um, and where these are located are under fundraising, um, checkout flow, and then you just toggle over to post checkout. Um, just make sure that that information is up to date for 2020. Sometimes because it's a little bit hidden, you can have things there from other years and that can be confusing for donors if they get uh, receipts that say thank you for your donation to Giving Day for APES 2018. Um, so just take a moment to update those two pieces. Um, banner images are another key part of your profile that is highly visible to donors. Um, so if you haven't refreshed yours in a while, um, try adding a new image there if you can, um, especially if you can tie it into your overall campaign story for 2020. That's even better than just having a general image there. Um, and then also check your media gallery. <clears throat> That's a little bit lower on your profile, but if you haven't uploaded any images since 2017 when you first built your profile, um, it may be time to add some new photos there that better represent what's happening at your sanctuary at this particular moment in time. Um, we always get lots of questions about this, so I wanted to go over resetting the metrics with you on your page, um, and that's actually in a new spot this year, so I wanted to go through this real quickly. Um, this year it's even easier than previous years, and you can update and reset your met metrics right on your organization profile page. It, uh, you just have to be in edit mode in order to do that. Um, you can get started by clicking the pencil icon, or it'll be a plus icon if you don't currently have any metrics set. Um, you can also access it from the quick edit menu at the top of the page by clicking on fundraising stats. Um, you'll want to start counting your donations from uh, September 14th, 2020, which is when early giving starts. So when you update your date, it'll reset your donation display on your profile to zero. Um, and you'll also want to set your 2020 fundraising goal if you have one for this year. Um, remember, it's totally fine to have goals that are not about how much you raise, but that progress bar on your page can really help motivate donors um, and you can change your goal. You're not locked into it. So it's a good idea to put in how much you're hoping to raise or a goal that you feel confident that you can achieve. And that can actually be a great strategy as having a stretch goal. So let's say last year you raised $5,000, which is a great amount. Um, you can set your goal for $5,000. And if you get over that or get to the point where you're very close to surpassing that, you can reset your goal, increase the amount and set a stretch goal so that donors will be motivated to come back and either make another donation or make their first donation once you set that stretch goal. Um, so this is easy to do. It's right on your organization profile page. You don't have to find a separate page anymore. So this is very easy. Um, and when you're updating your profile and refreshing everything, just refresh your metrics as well. Um, we haven't really emphasized this before, but 2020 is a new decade and it's a really great time to take a look at your settings and see who your admins are. Um, when you go into admins in your settings, you'll see a list of everyone who currently has access and you can actually manage them from this screen. Um, on Mighty Cause, it's all one level of access. So if you see someone's name there in your admin list, they have the same access that you do. Um, so you can add people through this screen, um, people who might need access to your page, like if you have volunteers this year who will be helping or new staffers or any admins um, that might need to pull a donation report. Um, and you can also remove any admins that don't work for you anymore. So if you had um, a volunteer a couple of years ago who helped you out, but that volunteer is no longer affiliated with your organization, you can just remove them so that they no longer have access through their Mighty Cause account. Um, one thing to also look for is duplicate accounts. Um, if you have an admin account that's connected to multiple different email addresses, it's usually a good idea to get rid of any that you don't actively use and just have one login for yourself um, because it can get really confusing if there's um, multiple people with your name and title that have admin access, unless of course you have a very good reason for that, then you don't need to do that. But sometimes over uh, the course of participating in this event year in, year out, people can develop duplicate accounts and have admin access with those multiple accounts, which can just get a little bit confusing. So you may want to just, if you have a duplicate account there, remove it. Um, you can have up to 10 admins at one time. Um, and just to clarify, since I think this can be a little bit confusing, there is only one type of user account and we grant admin privileges with based 
through that account. So usually there's no access that we can grant for your whole nonprofit. It's all tied to your user account. So if you can't log in or you're not sure what the login is, you'll need to use the email address that you registered for the event with. Um, part of the registration approval process is we grant you admin access to your page with the email address you used when you registered and you logged in. Um, or you'll need to sign up for an account and have a, a current admin grant you access through this page in your settings. So for instance, uh, some people will contact us and say, I'm not sure how to log in, um, and, or I don't know what my nonprofit's login is. Well, it's your login, it's your email address, and it's attached to you. So if you don't have one, you'll need to create one and then have an, a current admin give you access through the settings page. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, make that clear um, that there's one type of admin access and it's tied to your user account. So we don't have like nonprofit accounts. It's your user account and you're granted access with that account. So one of the easiest things you can do to make your profile look great and refreshed is updating your theme. Um, in your theme, you can upload or change your logo. Um, you can upload a new banner image, and you can also choose a filter color for your banner, banner image if you want. Um, you can also set a theme color, which will carry out through your profile, like on your donate button. Um, this is a really simple and easy thing that you can do to refresh your page for 2020. So just take a look at your theme. Uh, this can be a quick way to refresh how your page actually looks. So your story is really the centerpiece of your page and where you'll want to explain who you are, what you do, and why people should support your cause. Um, there's a really easy inline text editor that you can use to add some additional color and pizzazz to your page with headers, images, lists, and graphics and videos um, that will help your story stand out. Um, there's a GIF in here of an organization that's done a really excellent job organizing their story. Um, they've got headers, a video, some infographics about where they're donating donations go and how people can help. And we really just recommend utilizing this space to talk to donors and provide some skimmable, easy to read information about your organization. And you all have the coolest photos of any giving event I have ever managed. So please use your photos and show us the animals that you help. It's such an effective fundraising tool. And I just love seeing them in your stories year to year. So uh, make sure that you plug some, some images into your story. Um, and this, you, you can also add an additional tag where you can put more information about your organization that you want donors to be able to access but don't necessarily need to be front and center. So if you have something else that you want to say as an addendum to your, your story, you can put that information in a custom tab. So that's something cool you can also do with your, um, your story. Some organizations use it for you know statistics or details about how their money is spent. So those are kinds of things that add to your fundraising story um, that don't necessarily need to be on the the main page um, and I just wanted to point out that that is an option as well in case you wanted to provide some additional information about your organization and the work you do. Uh, we talked a little bit about this earlier, but refresh your media gallery. Um, add some new images, connect your Instagram if you use Instagram, um, just to add more life and more elements to your page. Um, one thing you can also do is optimize your social media sharing settings, which is in your settings um, under your general organization settings. So you can set it that if you want uh, people to tag your sanctuary automatically on Twitter, if they tweet about your, your organization and your campaign from that page, you can set that there. You can also upload a, a custom image for sharing on Facebook. If you don't like the image preview that's showing there, sometimes it's just your logo and it's not optimized. So you can add a, a custom image there. So there's a lot of cool things you can do to optimize your social sharing settings as well. And just take care of that media gallery. People will scroll down there and they'll take a look at what you've got. You guys have amazing photos, so make sure that you are adding some new ones for 2020. Um, donations and disbursements are under reports. Um, they're exactly where you would expect them to be, and it's just important to know where these are and how to access them so that if a donor is asking you a question on October 13th, you're not scrambling and trying to figure out, oh, I don't know where to find information about their donation. You know exactly where it is because you visited there and it's under reports. Um, as always, every admin for your organization will receive an email when a donation is made. Um, if this gets to be a lot on October 13th, um, I suggest sending 
putting them to a folder with your e that you can set up with your email provider so that they're not bothersome to you um, because you will get a lot of notifications on the giving day itself. Um, you can view donor information on this page, but just as a note, we have a limited display area here. So the details are in the full donation report, which you can export from your donation report page. Um, I did wanna t walk through some disbursement information if you have nonprofit status in the United States, you can set up EFT to receive your donations more quickly. Um, and if you have EFT set up, you will get your disbursement on the 25th of uh, the 25th of October for the giving day. Um, so take a quick look at your EFT settings and see what you have set up and verify that it's the correct account. Because if you have not updated it since 2017 and it's going to some bank account that like we do have checks in place so that if it goes nowhere we'll we'll know about that but if it's going to the wrong account and that account is still active but it's not the one where you want it to go there's not much we can do so check in see what account is connected for EFT and just make sure that it's where you want the money to go um, if you are fiscally sponsored meaning you're outside the US and you don't have a friends of organization with nonprofit status in the US um, don't worry about any of this because you'll receive the money that you raise from your fiscal sponsor. Also under reports, um, you can add offline gifts, um, and there's also a separate offline donation report so you can stay organized when you're entering those. So if you wanted to see what offline gifts have already been entered, you can easily pull a quick report to find out just the offline gifts. Um, you can add offline gifts to your page just to reflect the full scope of fundraising you're doing for Giving Day for Apes, but it's important to know that offline gifts do not count for your leaderboard totals or prizes. Um, however, we can see what offline donations are entered for the event um, and we may just reach out to verify if we see that your organization entered like a super large amount just to you know make sure that that was what you meant to do um, just for our purposes when we're calculating the event totals and um, we have also reached out in the past to nonprofits just to verify that they were aware of a donor who made a big donation I just wanted to mention that as well um, because something that happens surprisingly often is that people making donations um, add extra zeros. So instead of $50, they donate $5,000. And amazingly, that goes through on whatever card they use. Um, so that happens occasionally. So when it's a big amount with a lot of zeros, we usually just check in um, with your nonprofit just to make sure that you're aware of that donor because most donors who are making large gifts, you're already aware of and have talked to that donor. So that's another reason we might reach out. But generally speaking, the offline gifts are for display purposes only. You're just tabulating any cash or checks that were given to your nonprofit, but they do not count toward prizes. Um, another thing you'll also want to check is your checkout flow, which is under fundraising. Um, this is where you can choose what donor data you want to collect from donors and set your custom donation suggestions and descriptions um, and hopefully tie those into your campaign. Um, sometimes these are easy to forget about as well and just let them ride from year to year. So it's worth taking a look and making sure that these are up to date um, and making sure that they tie into your campaign. So for instance, if you're um, you know, campaigning for supplies for your clinic, you can make those donation amounts and suggestions about the specific things that you need to purchase and what those donation amounts provide. So that's a really great way to get people to bump up the amount of their donation um, and also just tell a cohesive story about why funding your organization is so important. Um, you can also preview the checkout steps here to make sure that you haven't built a really cumbersome and long donation form. Um, people are much more likely to complete donating when it's very easy. So you need to get what you need to get, but just make sure that it's not super long and, and arduous for them to complete that form. Um, and again, this is where you'll update your thank you message and page. Um, just toggle over to where it says post checkout and you'll be able to update those messages. All right, so this is the last slide for the technical part of this webinar. Um, something that is new this year and I wanted to talk about for a moment is the ambassadors tool, which will be available for this year's Giving Day for Apes. Peer-to-peer um, -peer is a very important Giving Day for Apes strategy, especially because there are prizes attached to it. Um, but if you have someone or several someones who maybe wanna get involved and they wanna help you fundraise, but they don't really want to create their own fundraising page and do a full peer-to-peer -peer campaign, what 
this tool does is it allows them to sign up to be an ambassador, which gives them their own personalized link that they can share that goes straight to your organization's page. Um, something they can also do if they are interested in it is become Giving Day for Apes ambassadors, where their link just goes to the Giving Day for Apes main page and people can navigate from there. Um, so one thing that's really cool about this is that we can see how much traffic these people bring in and how many donations they're actually bringing to the page that they are sending people to. Um, just as a note, this doesn't count for the peer-to-peer -peer leaderboard. Um, you'll still need for people to create an actual peer-to-peer -peer page to qualify for that leaderboard and any prizes associated with it. Um, but this is a really cool new way you can engage supporters that may not want to go, you know, whole hog and create their own peer-to-peer -peer page, but just want to do something quick and easy to boost your fundraising on Giving Day for Apes. Um, so we're adding that to the site and it'll be a new option this year that can help you raise more money and engage people. So I just wanted to quickly go over that and we We'll talk about that more in the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, webinar that's coming up next. Okay, so with the technical stuff out of the way, um, let's get into email marketing. Uh, some of you may not know, but I come from a nonprofit marketing background and I manage our email marketing here at Mighty Cause too. Um, so hopefully this information is actually helpful to you. Um, I really wanna get into the weeds a bit because um, the group of people who participate in this event, I see emails getting better and better every year and the fundraising uh, storytelling getting better and better. Um, and I really think that we can get into the nitty gritty of what kinds of emails emails to send and what tactics to use because you guys do such a great job every year. So the first email you want to send, especially when your profile is refreshed for this year, is a save the date email. Um, just letting them know that you're participating in Giving Day for Apes and to mark their calendars and get ready for it. Um, if you've already got a full schedule for emails, it can always be added on to another email or a newsletter. Um, and, but you can also turn this into an opportunity to plant the seed for peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, to recruit peer-to-peer -peer fundraisers. Um, if you need volunteer help, finding volunteers to help with the campaign if you're going to need them um, and sort of laying the groundwork for what this day is and how this event works. Um, in marketing, repetition is key to getting messages and dates and ideas to stick in people's minds. So adding a countdown to your regular emails or sticking reminders in your regular email marketing is a great way to build momentum, plant that seed, and make sure that when early giving opens up, your supporters are ready because they have, got, they have been given notice. Um, as I mentioned, early giving starts about a month before the event on September 14th, um, and that's when you'll really want to focus on your nonprofit's inner circle. Um, so when you're getting your email campaign together, um, plan out emails to people that your nonprofit counts on every year to support you. That means uh, recurring donors, volunteers, your staff, um, past Giving Day for Apes donors, um, and people that are close to your organization like your board of directors um, to help them get Help, help you get some money in the bank so that when the event switches over to live, you've already got some money raised. Um, and the messaging that works really well with these donors is acknowledgement that they are tried and true supporters. You can always count on them to come through. Um, so don't be afraid to go hard on that message with these particular donors because it's absolutely true. These are the people that you count on for support. Um, one thing I did want to chat about on this subject is that sometimes organizations can be a little wary of early giving and worried that it'll hurt what they raise on the big day. But last year we actually saw a ton of early giving for Giving Day for Apes, and we really didn't see that it affected um, day of giving in that way. Um, what early giving does is it helps your organization raise more overall. And one of the reasons for that is that with a month between early giving starting and the event happening, um, <clears throat> early giving usually means that instead of just giving early, people are actually giving more than once. So that's why um, you'll want to focus, especially on segments of donors that you know will show up for you because these are not people who are just going to make one donation of $15 and be done. They are invested in your organization. Um, and donors tend to do what I call paycheck math, um, which is that if they have the money when they are asked to donate, they will donate. Um, so for many people, as long as you don't hit them like twice in one week, if they have a new paycheck, they're probably going to make another donation if you ask them again. So there's enough buffer of, of time between early giving beginning and the event actually beginning that you're most likely going to get more than one donation from people rather than just getting one early donation from your donors. 
So when you're building your email strategy, you'll want to think about a few countdown type emails. Um, these are most effective um, before early giving begins and right before the event. Um, and in these emails, you're just trying to build momentum and develop some of that repetition I talked about that means by the time we get to October 13th, your supporters are familiar with this event and they are planning to give. Um, so some of the things you can talk about in countdown emails <clears throat> are your goals, your campaign's focus. Um, there's an email on this slide from Ape Action Africa, um, and they sent out a really great email explaining what they were raising money for on Giving Day for Apes. Um, they were raising uh, money to add lights and purchase equipment for their clinic and introduce the hashtag for their campaign, which was just a really smart marketing move. And they also used another tactic we're gonna talk about more in depth in a moment, which was an email from a leader at their organization. Um, you'll basically wanna set the stage for all the need to know information, um, like who, who who are you, what's happening, uh, where, when, why, and how to get involved so that you can concentrate on fundraising on the day of instead of introducing those things for the first time. And a PS or a postscript um, reminders at the end of regular emails like PS, don't forget Giving Day for Apes is 14 days away, can be a really great way to add a countdown if you've already got a full email schedule or there's something else that you're emailing donors about. So um, I wanted to talk about day of emails and sort of the bare minimum that you should do in terms of email marketing on the big day. Um, now you can certainly do more than this and you can go bigger than this, um, but these emails should really just be the scaffolding that you build your email campaign around. Um, social media is also really, really great and important, but the great thing about email is that you don't have an algorithm to contend with. Um, people will see your emails at the top of their inbox. Um, unfortunately, sometimes with Instagram, and Facebook, they won't see what you post on the same day in their feed. Um, the email gives you that immediate connection to your supporters. You're sending it straight to their inbox. So as long as they're checking their email, they will see your email when you intend for them to see it or shortly after you send it. Um, so email is just really important. And this is sort of the, the bare minimum schedule that I would suggest. Um, first, there's the kickoff email, letting everyone know that the event has begun, you're off to the races and asking for donations. Um, you should also plan emails for the power hours that your organization is eligible for. Um, and just send them out a little bit before the hour actually begins so that people are ready to go when it starts. Um, at least 15 to 20 minutes before is generally a good amount of notice notice that will put your email near the top of their inbox when they check it, um, but not email them too early so that they have an hour of their workday where they forgot about it. Um, doing a midday appeal with some information about how you're doing and how much you're raising is a really good idea. You can also use this as an opportunity to thank everybody who's made a donation so far. Um, and this is often a prime time for people to give. So make sure you have a campaign email scheduled for midday. Um, and one thing I cannot recommend enough is setting up a donor retention email. <clears throat> Put the email together and get it ready to go. And then on the big day, um, pull your don donor retention report from your profile um, around early evening, end of day, um, and just take that report, plug it into your email marketing program, whether you're using Constant Contact, MailChimp, Autopilot, whatever you're, you're using, um, and send it to the donors on that list that gave in previous years but have not yet given this year. Um, they haven't been retained yet. These donors are low-hanging fruit, so it's really important to reach out to them and make sure you're doing some specific outreach to the people who gave in the past and haven't given yet this year. Most people will give when asked, so just make sure you're doing a targeted email to them, and this is one where you can just sort of set it up in your email marketing program and then plug in the list um, when you pull it. Um, Giving Day for Apes often sees a boost in the last hour of the day, so send out a final hour email, letting people know that they have one more hour to donate and help you win prizes. It's totally okay to use some urgent language here. Um, and then finally, send out a quick wrap-up email just after the event's over. Um, you can plug in the details after the event and send that off. Just have that one ready to go and plug in how much you raised. Um, just to wrap it up and give yourself a little bit of extra time uh, to do some more intensive follow-up and a more organized thank you but that at least caps off the day and ends it on a good note you let them know thank you so much and you have some time to do some more um, detailed follow-up so having that one ready to go is is also a good one to have um, in your plan 
All right, so I wanted to talk through some of the things you should consider when you're building your email strategy. Um, first, Giving Day for Apes is in Eastern time. Um, I think we'll be in, I think we'll still be in daylight time at that point, but I'm not entirely sure about that. Um, but I know we have a few centers in that time zone, but most participants um, are in different time zones. So think about that when you're putting together emails, especially as it relates to power hours. So if you say no, that you have a ton of donors who are on Pacific time, taking the step of doing the time zone math for them will make it easier for them to understand when they are supposed to donate. Um, Jackie usually does a very thorough conversion of time zones on the prime pa the prize page for um, power hours in particular. So you can find that information on the prize page on the Giving Day for Apes site once that, once that is up. Um, you don't need to account for every time zone imaginable but you know where your donors are located. So it's worth thinking about ways to make it easier for them. Um, and if you have donors who are kind of, uh, you know, far flung and in different time zones, you can also consider if you're up to it, doing some segmentation so that you have the correct time in their time zone for the power hours. Um, on that subject, leaderboards and power hours and golden tickets are not part of the average person's lexicon. Um, so it may be helpful to explain what a power hour is why it's important, explain what the leaderboard is and how much you can win if you end up at the top of it. Um, you don't need to get super detailed. This can be something that you do in one of your countdown emails, um, but just a quick sentence about what those things are and what it means can help donors really wrap their head around those elements of the giving event. And something I really hope you'll consider is a personal outreach plan. Um, that personal touch of someone sending a direct email from their actual email address, or even making a phone call to, uh, you know, ask a donor to make their donation can make a huge difference in the return you get. So it's more effort, but you usually see a higher rate of return in people appreciating the gesture and actually going to your page to make a donation. So you may want to also build a direct outreach plan alongside your email marketing plan, especially for those donors who are really important to your organization and are worth making that extra effort for. So somebody who gave $10 in 2017 is maybe not you know, worth a phone call in the likelihood that they will follow up with a donation, but somebody who gives in a good amount every year, it might be worth that extra, extra mile for them. Um, volunteers can help with this and they can do it remotely. Um, so just write up a script for them and send them a spreadsheet with some people to contact and that part can be done easily um, and it definitely makes a difference. So um, when we're talking about email marketing, that's not the only part of it is constant contact in these blast emails. Um, personal outreach is also an important part of marketing. So I wanted to give some general marketing tips so that you can consider these as you build your plan and actually build the emails themselves. Um, we saw eight Ape Action Africa do this in an earlier slide, but emails from leaders at your organization are very impactful. So this can be a really great method to get more opens and get more people reading your emails, especially if these are really key emails where you want people to respond. Um, let me tell you, when Mighty Cause sends an email from our CEO, we get so many more opens and clicks. So it's something that you want to use strategically because if people think that like your executive director is spamming them, they're going to get annoyed. But if they see an email every once in a while from your executive director or your board chair or somebody important at your organization, they go, oh, I should pay attention to this. Um, so hearing from your executive director, your program directors and board members, um, that can really get people involved. And even if you're using an email marketing program, believe it or not, people do not realize in most cases that you're using a marketing program. They will go, oh my gosh, this person emailed me personally. This must be important. I'm always surprised by that, but it is the truth. People don't they aren't bothered by that. So it doesn't need to look like an email from that person's personal email for it to have the same impact. Um, this is such a tiny little thing, but it's so important. Uh, make sure you're putting a link in the first image of your emails. I don't know why this is true. I don't know why people do this, but this is the truth. People click on whatever the first image in your email is. It's very consistent across the board in all of my years of marketing. So whatever your main CTA link is for the email, whatever you're um, putting into in your CTA button, make sure that your images mirror that link, um, especially the first one in the email because people will click on it. Um, so that's just a, a quirky little tip that can make a huge difference and means that when the person clicks that image, instead of just pulling up a bigger version of that image, they're actually going to the link where you want them to go. Um, 
I saw some orgs doing this last year. Um, another silly little thing that makes a huge difference, but emojis in the subject line do lead to more opens. Um, you really don't have to go wild with these um, and have a huge string of emojis because that can do the opposite and look spammy, um, but some selectively chosen emojis can really help your open rates um, get up. Uh, just make sure that you know what the emoji means because they can have double meanings like the okay signal. Um, it can mean something not so good in certain cultures and even in the US it has a double meaning that you don't want to be sending to your supporters um, but you're always safe with say a sparkle emoji um, and they actually just released some new animal emojis this year um, I know that Android um, released an update with a gorilla and an orangutan so you are safe with those um, and again, suggesting amounts is recommended because if nowhere else in life, um, donors like to be told what to do when it comes to fundraising. Um, and they sort of use recommended amounts as a jumping off point for making their donation. Um, one thing you can also do if you have the capacity is segment your emails by the amounts donors given so that you can make a strong suggestion for how much to give in your email. So for instance, if you have people who typically have given in the 10 to $20 range, you can maybe suggest 25 or $30 to them. If people, you know, you have a list of people who normally give $100 to $200, try bumping them up to $250. So you can sort of do some work to segment your emails and make them more specific um, by suggesting amounts in your emails. This can also be really effective um, when we're talking about most unique donors, power hours. Um, definitely reminding people that they don't need to donate a lot to help you win a most unique donor power hour can be really helpful because it doesn't matter what they give and they, the platform minimum is five dollars um, and you can remind them of that when you're making your appeal that makes it seem more approachable and can help people actually click the button and make the donation um, in the United States right now it is election season um, and if you're getting any campaign emails you'll see that political political campaigns do this a lot because it's smart um, $13 may not ultimately be what somebody donates, but it gets them to click through the link. And sometimes when they click through the link and they end up on the on the form, they actually donate more. So your, your goal is really just to get them uh, to the page to make a donation. If they want to increase it at that point, they certainly can. Um, but that's a, a known uh, marketing technique that works and gets people to click through is by suggesting an amount that is approachable for them. All right, so I wanted to talk through some good campaign messaging. You guys do an awesome job with this every year, but just going through some, some really uh, key messages that you want to send. Um, because of you messaging um, is really effective, reminding donors that none of your work is possible without their support. Um, if you're in the United States, uh, public broadcasting does this a lot, and the reason is that it, it works, and you can actually see it in this email on the... Um, the, the slide, uh, they're using, they're literally saying, because of our fantastic donors like you, we've been able to provide daily care in an enriching sanctuary home for Linus and 50 more animals. So it just, it really works, it resonates, and it makes people feel um, that their, their contribution is appreciated. Um, <clears throat> Focus on hope, especially in our, our current climate, everything is upside down and feels on fire. Um, sending emails that paint your sanctuary as a place of hope um, lands really well, it resonates. People are looking for that. They're looking for second chances. They're looking for hope. They're looking for bright spots because everything feels really dark right now. Um, and you know, sanctuaries and animal rescue and conservation is a really great vehicle for that message of hope. Um, so you can hit people with a little bit of sadness Sadness, um, because that also tends to work, but just make sure that you turn it back around and it ends on a hopeful note. Um, keep the apes front and center. They are why your donors are involved in your nonprofit in the first place. They are what people care about. They are what brings them to your organization. So use the animals at your sanctuary to tell the story of what you do. How do you help these, these animals? you know, explain what you do through them. Um, you know, obviously you want to be cautious and careful about that, but you have these, these amazing animals in your care, so make sure that you are giving people what they care about, which are those animals. Um, and then also something that can really work, I've seen this done in previous years, is pulling back the curtain. Um, you know, show the work that you do, because it's really interesting. I work at a laptop all day. I am fascinated by caring for animals in a sanctuary because it's so far outside my normal life and donors love that too. It also gives a feeling of transparency to what you do. 
So giving people an inside peek at the, what their donations are helping to fund and what life is like inside your sanctuary, um, you know, who is doing the work, how they're interacting uh, with the animals, if they are obviously safely is the, the message there. But talking about the enrichment and things that you do for the animals in your care, that's really, really important. Um, and it can really land well with donors because they're getting, you know, a day in the life at your sanctuary. And it's something that a lot of us don't have access to or any idea what it's like. Um, so that may seem mundane to you because you do it day in and day out. But to your donors, that is fascinating and they love to see it. So that has been really successful for other sanctuaries in years past. So just consider that, you know, how you can add a little bit of personal, this is what we do vibe to your emails as well. All right, so I wanted to talk through a few examples of what not to do. So we've talked about what works, what does not work. Um, so first is the wall of text. Um, everybody is super, super busy. I know that I personally am not gonna read a giant, long, multi-paragraph email all in one sitting. So people, they absorb information a little bit differently in this day and age, they skim. They don't sit down and read word for word. They sort of dart their eyes across the email and try to find the important information. So make sure that your emails are skimmable. Break up your longer emails with headers, images, buttons, and other things that you can do to separate out the information and avoid that wall of text. You can certainly have a long email with a lot of information as long as you break that up. Um, having an unclear ask. Um, if you're just saying, please support us, well, what does that mean? Like, how are how do you want people to support you? So be clear and direct. Ask for what you want them to do. Like I said, donors like to be told what to do in a fundraising context. So exactly what are you asking for them? Uh, please support us is a very vague ask, whereas please donate $13 now is a very direct ask that donors can easily understand. Um, <clears throat> and if you have a long email, again, those are fine. Um, just make sure that you are repeating your ask, uh, what you're asking the person reading the email to do throughout the email. So if you have a long story with images and headers, um, you don't wanna bury your, your CTA button that you want them to click, click at the bottom of the email. You may need that link several times throughout your email just to make sure that people are able to easily find it. Um, something that is, um, I my background is in animal welfare as well, and something that's a particular problem with people in that field um, is jargon. So jargon is something you do not want to include in your emails. Um, like I was just saying, most people don't work at an animal sanctuary, so make sure that when you're explaining to them, you're not using jargon that they don't understand. If you, you know, if somebody on the street randomly wouldn't understand it, don't use it. Um, don't use inside baseball language. Um, these can really turn people off because they don't understand it and it makes them feel small and stupid because they're not able to understand what you're telling them. So it's very easy to fall into in animal care fields especially, but just make sure that you're using plain, clear language. Um, say what you mean, um, but don't include any jargon in your emails. Um, whole list blasts only. Um, so definitely blasts should be part of your email plan, um, but one after another can feel kind of stale and they you know, start to see past them. Um, and you wanna engage certain types of donors specifically, like I was talking about with recurring donors, people who've given in the past and are not yet retained. So spend some time uh, talking about the people that you wanna target specifically and doing a little bit extra for those donors instead of just sending them the same blasts that you might give somebody on your email list who's never donated to your organization. Um, so just think about that. Um, you know, you go beyond the blast. Um, definitely have blast emails to your whole list, but what can you do beyond that to get more specific in how you're communicating with people? Um, I did want to go through a few best practices. Um, this should be hopefully obvious to everybody this day and age, but optimize for mobile. So when you're choosing your email template, make sure that you are using a mobile-friendly template. Um, most of us are not looking at a laptop or a desktop computer when we're checking our email. We're on our phones. Um, and the other part of that is test it out. Um, actually send a test email to somebody and have them check it on an iPhone or an Android phone, both ideally, just to make sure that it looks good. Um, just because sometimes it can work when you preview it and then when you actually look at it on a phone, 
things are a little out of whack. So you just want to make sure that you actually test your, your emails and that they look good on mobile devices. Um, use a mixture of text and images. Um, images, and this is something that is a little bit of a trend in email marketing, just having nothing but images. Um, but that puts you in a really awkward position if they don't load, um, which could happen because sometimes people are using something like Microsoft Outlook and it's not going to load the images because they're at work and their employer takes out all images and emails. That is something that happens more than you would think. Um, there's also people who use screen re readers who are not looking at images and emails. And so unless you're including alt text in all of your emails, people who use screen readers might not be able to understand what your email is saying to them. So definitely use images and pictures, but make sure that you also are telling your story with text. Um, it's a trend that I don't think is a particularly good one. Um, and you guys are usually pretty good at it. So I just wanted to make sure that you're using both. Um, you're using images and you're using text. And if you are able to through your email marketing program, adding a little bit of alt text to your images will ensure that people who are using screen readers um, are able to tell what's in the images because their screen reader can uh, access that information and they're getting the full uh, you know, experience of reading your email. <clears throat> And spend some time focused on the donor. This is something that we can easily overlook in marketing. We want to talk about us and what we do. Um, but most donors like to hear about themselves because they want to feel appreciated. That's why the because of you messaging is so important and it's so effective. So spend some time talking about the person reading the email, how they can help, how they can get involved, how the apes are counting on them for their support. And that can really help draw people in because people like to hear about themselves. Um, so make sure that you're also talking about donors and specifically the donor in the email, the one that's reading it when you're putting your emails together. Um, use personalization if you're you're able to um, go through your list and make sure that you have the information you need because there's really nothing that will kill a, an email that's meant to feel personal than seeing dear first name. Um, so just make sure that you have the information if you want to use personalization variables. But if you do have that information and you can use them reliably, that's a really great way to make your, your emails more personal and include the donor in the email instead of just only talking about what your organization does. All right, and uh, last thing I'll say before passing things back to Jackie is to get support from us. We are here to help you. Um, our support team is available to you. Um, you can email us at support at mightycause.com. You can also give us a call. We are a Monday through Friday operation, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern time. Um, our phone number is right there. Um, you can also send requests to me. I'm more helpful with uh, strategy. I haven't worked in support, so sometimes I'm not as great at getting back to those emails with the right answer immediately and have to send them to our support team anyway. Um, so if you have a technical question or you're trying to locate something, please don't be shy about contacting our support team. We're real people. We're here to help you. That is part of our job. Um, and just to let you know, on uh, Giving Day for Apes, we are there the entire duration of the event. We will always have support members checking our, our our queue checking incoming requests so that if you have an emergency, send it to support because we will have somebody there for the whole 24 hours. Will not be the same somebody, but somebody will be there to help you. All right, just turning it over to Jackie again. Thanks, Linda. So here we are with our sneak preview on prizes. Oh, sorry. Well, no, go back. <laughs> sorry. Sorry about that. No problem. So in the past few years, we've awarded a total prize package of $50,000, and this year we have even more. Uh, thanks to our generous sponsors, our prizes this year will total $58,000. And this is going to include a combination of some that you're familiar with already, such as leaderboards and power hours and golden tickets, although there may be something new about some of those. And we're also going to have some new types of prizes as well. Um, we've been working to design a prize menu that's really, I think, going to give every participating organization, whether you're large or small, whether you have dedicated fundraising staff or not, it's going to give you a chance to win some meaningful cash prizes. Um, next slide. Yep. And we're going to tell you the details of the prizes during our next webinar on August 25th. And by that day, we'll also have posted our new prize structure on the Giving Day website. Uh, so during that webinar, we're going to go through each prize category to make sure uh, we explain what they are, the amounts, the rules, and when during the event they're going to be awarded. 
um, so that you'll have all those details and you can consider your strategy for contacting your supporters. Uh, we're also, during that webinar, going to be talking about peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, which has its own leaderboard in the event, and I'll give you another hint. There may be a change to that leaderboard prizes this year. We've talked about peer-to-peer -peer fundraising in the past. We had a webinar talking about it last year, and we saw a doubling of funds raised through peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. It went up from about 42,000 of the total to 84,000 of the total which is very exciting. So this year we're going to give you a few more resources to make it really easy for you to ask your supporters to help you raise funds for Giving Day. Um, and so that's it for me. Other than I wanted to say, we are going to be starting our Save the Date announcements on Tuesday, August 18th. Start generating excitement for the event on social media. And the logo for this year's Giving Day is available for your downloading through the Giving Day website. So you can start putting that on your own promotions. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Linda. All right. Um, so I don't have any questions. This is the live Q&A portion. So if you have something you would like to ask me or Jackie, um, go ahead and put that into the questions box of your GoToWebinar panel. This is your chance. You've got us live. You, we, you won't have to wait for an email. So I'll give you a minute to see if you have any questions, if you want to type those in right now. Um, and one thing that I did want to address, because it's something that I'm hearing from a lot of nonprofits and people participating in giving events is sort of talking through whether it's okay to ask. Um, so definitely throughout the world at this point, uh, a lot of people are hard hit by coronavirus and the resulting economic problems. And so there are a lot of nonprofits that are just like, oh, is it okay for us to ask them for money right now? Um, and the answer is overwhelmingly yes. Um, without getting too into the weeds, we've actually seen charitable giving through our platform go up like a lot. So things are doing well for nonprofits. Um, and part of that is because people look for ways to help when the world feels out of control and scary. Um, so that's something that we're, we're definitely seeing here at Mighty Cause. So um, if you're feeling a little bit anxious about asking your donors for money, because that's something that I'm hearing is very common right now, please don't be afraid to ask them because they are rising to the occasion, even if your organization is not directly helping with uh, vi coronavirus relief or anything that's in the news and happening in the world right now. So that's one blanket statement I wanted to um, address while I had everybody on a webinar. Um, and we don't have any questions at this point. If you have any questions, I'll give you a few more seconds to enter that into the questions box. Um, otherwise, you will have to email me or Jackie um, or both of us uh, specifically to ask your question. Um, so I'm just going to put myself on mute for a minute and uh, see if any questions come in. And I just want to uh, add, I mean, there's a lot of information that was presented today and these webinars are recorded. So you're going to be able to go through the slides in your own time and listen to the recording again in your own time if you really want to go back and refresh on how to update your page and uh, go over the new features on the Mighty Cause platform. Uh, yeah, absolutely. They'll be uploaded as soon as I'm able to get the video up on YouTube. Um, and you'll also have a, an option to download the slides if you wanted to use, you know, look over the slide deck or share that with any of your colleagues or any volunteers. Um, so at this point, I'm not actually seeing any questions come in, um, but you guys can always email us um, if you wanted to talk to us. You know Jackie's email, and my email is lynda at mightycause.com if you have any questions. And as you're going through your profile and you're updating for 2020, um, also utilize support. That's support at mightycause.com. They're very quick. They have a lot of resources to help you out. So um, make sure that you you contact support with any technical questions. Um, but with that, I guess we'll wrap it up. Thank you to everybody who attended today. Um, I'll put the recording up as soon as possible, as well as the slides. Um, and thank you to Jackie for helping me present this webinar. Well, thank you, Linda. And um, looking forward to a good event for all of you. Yeah, absolutely. Happy fundraising, everybody.